right, so the basic outline is going to be uh, going to talk about the circumstances that led to actually designing this laptop. Then I'm going to go over some of the steps, just a broad outline of the steps that were taken to design this. And then I'm going to talk about how you can get started uh, designing it. Um, yeah. Does this work? No. Come back here. Um, to start with, what is Novena? Um, this is the basic outline of the, the block diagram. The Novena is the laptop on the side. I have a, a Novena up here. It is a quad-core, ARM-based, completely open laptop. It boots without any binary blobs. And the CPU diagram is there on the side. It's what's called a, um, <laughs> it's what's called a system on a chip. So the one CPU has uh, a whole bunch of different blocks in it. Uh, one CPU has a memory controller. It has what a PC would be considered the South Bridge and the North Bridge integrated on one CPU. Uh, the, the, this laptop was designed in Singapore with myself and Bunny, who's on the. Oh, okay. This works. The laptop was designed in Singapore by myself and Bunny, this person. Um, we both had, oh, this is going to be really, any further? It's all about hardware hacking, right? So we both had an idea. We both has, had this dream when we were younger. We both wanted to build a computer. And when you build a computer, normally you think about something like this, which is a gray box that you buy the components, you buy the motherboard, you buy the CPU, the sound card, and the hard drive, and you put it in a case. But we both wanted to do something a little bit better. We both wanted to design our own computer that we, we would use from the ground up. And to that end, when I graduated from university, I went to work for a company called Chumbi, which built uh, small digital embedded alarm clocks like this one that ran Adobe Flash. The important thing about the Chumbi was that it ran Linux. It was a completely open source hardware and software platform that ran Adobe Flash. So that bit wasn't so open. But it's okay. I wasn't really interested in Adobe Flash. I was more interested in the hardware and the software. So I did the best I could and I put some Easter eggs into this as the firmware designer. For example, if you plugged in a USB keyboard, a console, a root shell, would drop down from the top and you would have full root access. Um, I also ported mPlayer and a couple of other software packages, but the thing is, this machine was really slow. It was 450 megahertz, and so as a personal machine, it wasn't that great. But it gave me a couple of things. It gave me an interest in kernel programming, and it taught me how to read a data sheet. Um, Every platform at Chumbi had a code name that was based off of an area in World of Warcraft, and so this particular one was called Falcon Wing. One other thing that Chumbi gave me was an interest in manufacturing. Um, it, it's really cool. A lot of manufacturing is done in China. A lot of it's in a place called Shenzhen. And it's a bit harrowing. It's kind of like the compilation and distribution step of software because you take a thing you've designed and then you make it so that everyone else can go and see your design, can buy your design, can access your design. Without manufacturing, it's just craft. But with manufacturing, it's something that other people can use and play with and have fun with. Um, it's also a bit harrowing because all of your mistakes are replicated 10,000 times by somebody on the other side of the world. So it can be kind of uh, difficult sometimes. One problem with manufacturing in China is that Chumbi as a company was located in San Diego and manufacturing is done in Shenzhen, China, which traveling from San Diego to Shenzhen takes about 24 hours of real time. And you cross 16 time zones and depending on how you get there, three to four countries. Uh, and this just isn't sustainable. So Chumbi decided to open up an office for us and ship both Bunny and myself out to Singapore, which is much nicer than China in the sense that they speak English and they have two gigabit per second unfiltered fiber internet to the house, which is pretty sweet. 
Singapore is also a four-hour flight to China rather than a 24-hour flight, which means that visits to the factory when they call up and they say, hey, uh, those parts you ordered, they came in in pink instead of blue, can you come help us out? Uh, those trips you can actually leave in the morning, visit the factory, and be back in Singapore in time for dinner. Uh, once we were in Singapore, we decided to continue to evolve. This platform is called Silver Moon. This is based on the 8-inch picture frame. And we took the core, which, because it was open hardware, we took our own core and ported it to these two platforms. One was uh, a platform that overlays video on top of TV, uh, and the other one is a robot controller board for a design competition in the U.S. And if you look at these pictures, you can see that the CPU is kind of the same, the memory is, is at an angle, and they both have the same FPGA. Uh, there's a blank spot on the bigger board on the right to add a second HDMI port in case we wanted to turn it into um, an NETV. And with the Covan, which is the board on the right, you could see we started to move to our new naming scheme. Rather than naming it after places in uh, World of Warcraft, we named, started naming things after metro stations in Singapore. So Covan is a, a metro station in Singapore. Um, unfortunately, in January 2012, Chumbi as a company ceased to exist, and Bunny and I, along with everyone else in the company, was effectively laid off. And we were given a choice. We could either come back to the US, go to, it was Fremont or someplace like that, and work for Technicolor, uh, or we could stick around in Singapore and possibly try and realize our dream. And so we chose option B. Uh, and around this, this time, conveniently enough, Freescale, who had made the CPU, that was used in both the Chumbi one and the original Chumbi came out with a thing called the IMX6. It was available in a bunch of different uh, single, dual, and quad varieties. The 6Q is the quad core, and we thought that this would be an interesting way to try and realize our dream of building our own fully usable system from scratch. Now, one of the questions that I get is, why do we go with Freescale? Why not go with one of the other name brands that you may have heard of? Qualcomm has their Snapdragon. Samsung has their Exynos. Uh, TI has their OMAP that is very popular in the Beagle. Uh, Raspberry Pi has the Broadcom chip. You know, why don't you use one of those? And there's a number of reasons. A big reason is that the reference manual. This is the reference manual that tells you everything about the chip. If you have a complete reference manual, you have the keys to the kingdom, you can do anything with the chip you can imagine. The reference manual has the memory map, it has the clock tree, it has the interrupt vectors, and it has each one of the blocks. For example, the serial port is described in here. And if you look closely, um, this reference manual is very extensive. And you could download this. You don't even need to go to Freescale. You don't need an account. You don't need to sign a non-disclosure agreement. You can find it by just looking for IMX6 reference manual without running through any red tape. This is huge, and it's very unusual. One of the only other chip vendors I know that does this is TI, and they're not nearly as extensive as Freescale. Another reason is we didn't want to design in a chip that was unobtainium. A lot of these chips, you can't buy a single Snapdragon processor. You can't buy a single Exynos processor. Uh, you have to buy it in quantities of 10,000 or a million. We didn't want to build in a chip where if we give you the plans to the circuit board, you say, great, I can make this, right? And you, we, we don't want to be the ones to say, no, you can't actually buy the CPU. With the IMX6, you can go to DigiKey, a very common parts vendor. You can search for IMX6Q and you can get them in quantity one. And that's very unusual, again, when it comes to this sort of space. In quantity one, they're more expensive. They're about $45 uh, last time I checked. Um, but you can get it. It's not complete unobtainium. So we're not building something that we say is open, but you can't actually build it. Another, people, another question people ask is, why do you go with the A9, the Cortex-A9, which is an older chip? Why don't you go with something with the A15 or the newer A57, the 64-bit ARM? It's the same reason. If you look on DigiKey, you sort by core processor, uh, the A9 is really the fastest you can get. So the reason why we went with this chip is because it is the best and most open chip we could find. Uh, finally, the IMX6 had very early mainline support in Linux. When you design a chip, generally what happens is you buy the chip from the vendor, Freescale, Texas Instruments, whoever, 
and they give you what's called a board support package. And this contains a copy of Linux, a copy of all the libraries, and their preferred compiler, and you're supposed to use that. And it generally started out life as a Linux kernel, but it's just been mutated so much with so many proprietary vendor patches that it's not sustainable by anyone. It's not maintained by anyone except the vendor. So by going with mainline, we get to take advantage of community support and have support for this particular platform and really all IMX6 boards for as long as the Linux kernel is maintained. So this or mainline support was completed in 2011, so before silicon was ever officially available, it was available in the Linux kernel tree. And other people have the same opinion of, of Freescale. These are four example platforms that use the IMX6. Uh, the top two, the QBox and the Hummingboard, are by a company called Solid Run that we do a lot of work with. Um, they're very good. If you ever need a, uh, the number two there, the Hummingboard is a Raspberry Pi clone that instead of the Raspberry Pi CPU, it's a quad core, uh, 800 megahertz. It's, it's, it's a nice platform. I'd re really recommend it. Um, so January 2012, Chumby goes under. We think a little bit. We have a, a chat. We powwow. We decide that we're going to do this. And then in July 2012, we have schematics done. Now, when you design a board, there are multiple steps. You start with schematics, then you design a printed circuit board, and then you actually get it built. A schematic is exactly what it sounds like. It is kind of a wire diagram of how the chip is going to look. Um, in order to get a schematic diagram, you have to come up with all sorts of decisions. Which features of the chip are we going to use? Which um, uh, pins are we going to use? Which extra chips are we going to put on the board? Which power management are we going to use? And so it took a good six months to get to the point where we had schematics. September 2012, that's two months later, we have the PCB complete. And the printed circuit board is where you run all the wires from the schematics to connect everything with actual copper traces. You write, you put copper on the board, you put holes on the board to uh, mount things, you put vias on the board, you generally lay out everything. And Novena is an eight layer board and it's very time consuming and a very manual process. It's possible to do it using an automated auto router, but they tend to really not do a very good job. So every trace on this board is laid out by hand. And when you get to things like memory, where each trace has to be, you have 64 lines that all must be run in parallel because in a single line, you can have multiple signals on the line at the same time. So if a wire is about this long, you might have six or seven bits in the wire at the same time. And they must all arrive at the same time. And in order to make that work, you have to make sure that all 64 lines are routed the same. And that is a very time consuming process. So here's a, a 3D picture of the board. Most schematic and board layout software lets you do 3D and it's nice to be able to visualize it before you can actually see it. So September 2012, we have the board laid out. December 2012, we actually have first hardware. It's all populated, it comes from the factory, and we put in a boot card that we'd made ahead of time, and the thing actually starts up, amazingly enough. Uh, we got really lucky with the RAM timings, um, and we got a boot prompt. It didn't actually boot all the way, because of course we hadn't written the drivers, but no smoke came out, and that's always a good sign. Hooray. Um, one of the things we learned during the construction of this is that laptops are really complicated. And to illustrate this, I'm going to go over the, um, I'm going to go over the power input for some of the projects I've talked about, and I'm going to compare it to Novena. To start with, there was NETV. This is what it looks like uncropped. Uh, this is powered by USB. And the input circuitry looks like this. There is uh, a filter that removes some noise from USB. Uh, and that's basically it. It takes five volts in and you start up. Covan, which remember was a robot controller board, has a battery pack and it drives motors, so it's a lot more noisy. Uh, it also has a, a battery charger and we added an undervoltage lockout to make sure that it'll shut down if the battery gets too low. So it looks a bit more complicated. Novena looks like this and its basic power input looks like this. So you have the 5 volt regulator, which is 
uh, very similar to what is in Covan and NETV, except now it can take a much wider range of voltages, up to 30 volts. Uh, there's also a 3.3 volt regulator and a power switch, and the under voltage lockout is there as well. In addition, because it's a laptop, every subsystem has a power switch, because when you go into suspend, you want to turn off things like the hard drive and the audio chip, and each system has its own power switch. Um, everything else, we decided to move to a separate card called Sunoco, and this takes care of all the battery management and things like that. It has a charger that takes voltage in and makes sure that the battery is not catching fire when it puts current into it, another desirable feature of a battery pack. Um, we have a gas gauge that measures the number of coulombs that go into the battery pack. It also makes sure that the battery voltage isn't too out of swing and also makes sure that the cells are in balance and that they don't charge each other, which, again, can result in a fire. In case you haven't realized, the failure mode for a battery pack is catching fire. Um, it also has a full 32-bit CPU to manage all of this and also manage things like hitting the power button and um, there's a real-time clock and all these things are managed by this laptop called Sunoco. Uh, it also has a shell. I mean, it's, it's got a multi-threaded operating system, 36 megahertz, 16K of RAM. It's a whole other project in itself that we had to design in order to get a laptop. Uh, so we put this all together. Uh, one year later, December 2013, we presented with this. And this is the laptop with its first incarnation. Uh, it was uh, put together using book binding techniques bound in leather uh, and uh, it has aluminum cut frames and 3D printed parts and it, it worked reasonably well. Uh, there, are, there were a number of issues. First off, getting this thing through airport security is a bit of a nightmare. Uh, turns out people don't like it when battery packs aren't neatly aligned in 90 degrees. Um, but it worked. We got it there. We did a presentation and people really wanted to sell it. People said, hey, that's great. Can I buy it? And we said, no. But people said, but we really want to buy it. Can you do a crowdfunding campaign? And after we did our presentation, we had a group chat uh, with other people coming in and giving us information. And people convinced us there that there was a market, that people would buy it, that enough people would buy it that we should put in the effort to actually do a crowdfunding campaign. And so we did. We did the crowdfunding campaign through a company called Crowd Supply. And we got funded. We asked for $250,000. And amazingly, we got $782,000, uh, which, is, which is huge. We weren't expecting anything like that. But the thing is, if you're trying to start a crowdfunding campaign and you want to do a hardware project, there are a whole bunch of things that you never think about that you actually have to design with a hardware project. Once you have the main board, that's just the beginning. You have to think of all sorts of other things, like a factory test. When you do a software project, you want to do a factory test. You want to, when you do a software project, um, like a Rails project or a JavaScript framework or something like that, you do a unit test that tests each individual unit to make sure that you haven't broken code. Similarly, a factory test makes sure that the person who put this all together didn't accidentally uh, short out one particular section or didn't forget to put a chip in or put a chip in upside down. A factory test must test every single thing on the board which means you're basically designing your pro product twice, once to write the drivers and once to test all the, the, the bits. We also had to come up with plastics, and again, this is a thing that you don't normally think about. Before, we had 3D printed parts, but eventually we decided to get injection molded plastic. Uh, every single bit in here has to be injection molded or cut or ordered from some other thing. The, the factor that we dealt with, we were trying to get them to order these, these spacers. They're up there uh, the, on the right on the bottom, these spacers to, um, to, to keep the boards from touching each other. And they couldn't find spacers. And they said, well, we'll just 3D, we'll just injection mold it. No problem. Okay, now we're in the business of selling injection molded spacers. That happens. Uh, you also have to come up with other components and source every one of these. You need to source, uh, we had to source the, the bezels, we had to source springs, we had to support source clips, uh, get these all CNC milled. These are just things that you don't normally think about. Um, you have to source components. And the way it's done is you go into China and there are these huge markets that just look like this. It's floor after floor, block after block, these markets that are full of parts. And this is 
even if you buy a ticket and a visa to go to China and you just walk around these markets, that alone can usually be enough to save you. Uh, usually that's a money-saving adventure because when you buy a single resistor from DigiKey, they can be anywhere from one to 10 cents. But in these markets, you can buy a reel of 10,000 resistors for $2. So if you're spending 10 cents per resistor and you go here, you're going to be saving $1,000 an hour just walking around. And that is one of the big secrets to cost down, is just walk around these markets, find resistors, and buy them. Unfortunately, uh, these markets are going away in favor of Taobao, which is kind of like eBay meets uh, Amazon meets uh, flight uh, ticket ordering. It's basically everything is available on Taobao. Uh, and this is me costing down our Wi-Fi card. Um, you just type in the Wi-Fi part number and then you find it's a vendor. If you've ever used Alibaba or AliExpress, those are the English versions of this site. Uh, they tend to mark it up two to three X, so if you can get it on the Chinese site and you can get some way to ship it to you, that's usually cheaper. But a lot of times the factory, when you order a part from factory, they'll just go to Taobao and buy it from there and save you money. Uh, there are also various other boards that you have to design that you don't think of. You have the main board, the Novena main board, but uh, there's the board on the left there is the lid sense switch board. When this lid is closed, it detects that the lid is closed and it sends a signal. That's a separate circuit board. The one in the middle is just a front panel bo uh, board. We didn't have that for the longest time until we were just about ready to ship the, the board because we didn't even think about it. The board on the right there is a thing that most people don't normally think of as a circuit board. It is a cable that connects the main board to the video screen. And most people say, no, that's a cable, that's not a board. But we laid that out in layout software. And if you look at it, you can see that it's not uniform thickness in the middle. Uh, the middle traces are all very skinny, and the ones on the either side are very thick. And that's because the traces on the side are power and uh, uh, resistive signals, where the ones in the middle are differential signals. So we actually had to think about that and lay that out and get that fabricated. We also had to do an embedded display port board, and this one's kind of interesting, uh, because I mentioned how the IMX6 doesn't have the latest chip, the latest CPU core, and it also doesn't have the latest video technology. Most previous generation screens are connected through what's called low voltage differential signaling, LVDS. Uh, if you have a thick laptop, uh, the T60s probably use LVDS signaling. Um, that's what this CPU can output. But most modern generation panels, such as uh, this one, and I see a couple of apples in the audience, and iPads, uh, they all use what's called embedded display port. And it's the exact same display port that you get when you plug in a monitor, it's just in an embedded form. And so we had to come up with this board that converts using this chip, it's an IT6251, to convert from LVDS to EDP. Um, and it was a bit difficult to find this. Uh, this is the first generation of the board, it uses a completely different chip. Uh, we asked our factory, do you know of any boards that do this, and they came up with this one, which was really not very sustainable. I mean, this picture is kind of blurry because I had to dig through old photos to find this, but this chip was uh, from a vendor that really didn't want to sell it to us, so the fact that we had it was kind of questionable, um, and it didn't have a very open reference manual. Additionally, we were overclocking it by about 60%, so that was not very ideal. Um, and it's not the kind of thing, it's the kind of thing that you could do for a personal project, but you can't go to production with something like that. So we were going around the markets again in China, and if you go to a place called Golconda, and you go up to the third level, it's full of LCD panels. It's just a wave of LCD panels. There are so many panels there. If you need any panel, in any shape or size, it's going to be there. And this is where you go if you want one panel to replace your laptop or if you want 10,000 because you want to build a laptop. And we went there looking for a new panel. And we found a vendor there who had uh, a panel such as this. And we said, can we buy it? And it was in better display port. And she plugs it into her tester like this. 
The way it works is because you're buying a panel, you may not know if it's good or not, they have these little boxes like that on the side that generate test patterns. So you can see any potential problems with the backlight or potential problems with uh, stuck pixels or dead pixels or dead stripes or anything like that. So they have these specialized boxes that generate nothing but test patterns. And this woman had a test pattern generator that was LVDS and somehow she plugged in an EDP monitor. And we said, wait a minute, that's exactly the same thing we want. Can we see what your setup is? And she said, sure, this is what I use. We opened it up and we found this little tiny board in there that was doing the conversion. Wow, that's amazing. Can we buy that board? We said. And she said, no, it cost me $400. You can't buy it. So somebody's making a living selling $400 LVDS to EDP adapter boards. Um, well, maybe we could just figure out what chip they're using and put that in our board. But if you look closer, um, somebody has actually scraped off the surface marking of this chip because they don't want anyone else to build $400 adapter boards. Uh, that was a bit of a problem. But if you look at a picture like this, you can generally tell which pins are ground, which pins are power. You can tell which pins are kind of signal. Uh, and from this information, you can do an internet search looking for chips that match this uh, and hopefully you can find something that, that's similar. And through this, we actually managed to find the chip that we use now, the 6251 that is available for much cheaper than $400. It's about six. Uh, and we put that in the board. So this sort of costing down and uh, exploring the market is really important if you want to build a laptop like this. So let's say you want to do something like this. Where do you start? Well, this is open source. You start by copying somebody else. Everyone does it. We have source code up for our motherboard. We have source code up for our battery board, Sunoco. We have all of our source code, all of our schematics. Everything is available. If you're doing electronics, generally, uh, the reference manual for whatever chip you have will have a schematic like this. And I recommend just copy this schematic because it is guaranteed to work. Don't try and understand what you think is going on and then design something completely different. Start with the schematic because it's probably working because it's coming from the vendor. Um, a lot of times they'll even provide reference. Uh, this is from a, a broadcast, an Internet of Things type device that I'm working with. Uh, and they call out radio frequency regions, what it should look like on the circuit board. They'll give you the circuit board. So they'll give you the printed circuit board schematics. They'll give you the uh, printed circuit board layout, Gerber files. They'll give you everything you need. Copy what they've done because it's going to work. Secondly, don't start big, start small. USB is very easy to route. It's two wires, D plus, D minus, five volts, and ground. It's very easy to route, and if you're designing a device to plug into something, you can plug into anything with USB. If you're designing a computer or something like that and you want to plug USB into it, then you can plug anything you can imagine into the device you're designing. USB is huge. USB 1.1 and 2.0 are very easy to route, uh, and there's really not much that can go wrong. Once you've done something like that, you can then move up to something a little bit more complicated. HDMI is just like running four USB wires in parallel. It's just four differential signaling lines instead of just one. Uh, plus some other things like hot plug detect, which is just a line that's high. Um, but it's, it's very simple. Start simple, then build up. Um, make mistakes. Everyone makes mistakes, and this particular slide is an excerpt from the uh, RGMII manual, which is the manual that defines the physical chip interconnect for if you're doing gigabit ethernet. Um, it's, a not, it's a very dry subject, but uh, in fact we didn't even read this manual until after we laid out the board. And there's an interesting note in here. The top two columns on that table define clock skew. So remember how earlier I said you need to run wires in pairs to make sure that the speed of light matches so the signal is the same when it gets to the end. Um, well, it turns out that with RGMII, when you're talking to gigabit ethernet, you have to make it so that the clock line gets there two and a half nanoseconds later than the actual data. Um, and this makes no sense whatsoever. If anybody is here from HP, I would like to lodge a complaint. Um, we run the, ran them together and we booted it and it didn't work. 
Uh, turns out everyone makes this mistake. And uh, because it's such a common mistake, you can fix it in software. There's a register you can tweak in most chips that lets you adjust it so you can add this delay rather than running uh, f 10 centimeters of extra copper for this line, you just tune a register setting. So even if you make mistakes, a lot of times it's not catastrophic. Having said that, don't route power to ground because that is pretty catastrophic. Um, fortunately, you're lucky in this in that most design software will prevent you from doing it. This is a very simple schematic where I route power to ground and it doesn't validate. So in this sense, Software will save you here. Software will prevent you from routing power to ground and turning your board into a very expensive Christmas light. Um, this is getting a little bit more practical now, but when you're building boards, build five at a time. When you're prototyping, a lot of times you want to build one. It just It seems like the natural thing to do. But if you're getting it done by a board house, a lot of times to build one board is something like $150. To build two boards is $152. And to build three boards is $154. So it, the first board is very expensive. Every subsequent board is a little bit expensive. And I say build five boards because two will not be assembled correctly. They will not work for one reason or another. One, you're going to break. You're going to drop it. You're going to accidentally f delete flash. You're going to solder it and it's going to come apart. Or you're going to try and rework it and it'll fail. You're going to lose one board just out of incompetence. Um, but two will work. Two boards will work out of your initial five, and those will be the ones that you work on while you rev revise the hardware. So those two boards, especially if you're doing an Internet of Things application or something where you need them to communicate, five is the magic number. Build five and you'll get two out of it, at least with initial runs. And finally, you're all here, so you obviously enjoy this sort of thing. Have fun. If it's not fun, don't do it. If you're having fun, do it. It's the number one rule. So I'd like to thank some of the people in our community who have been just completely awesome when it comes to this. Uh, Sorcerer, uh, Bunny did, does a lot of the schematic layout and he uses a proprietary software called Altium that can be had for initial investment for the low value of uh, $5,000. Uh, he wrote a package, a Perl script that converts Altium to KiCad and it works really well. So much thank you to Sorcerer. A person named Job submitted some patches to the embedded display port chip that helps it uh, come up more reliably. This person on our forum, McCallan, um, I, I love it when people copy our software. He said, hey, so you have the schematics. Would you mind if I build them? Anybody want to buy schematic uh, battery boards? And we said, sure, go for it. Do you need any help? Um, so he did a full run of our battery boards. Somebody actually beginning to end cloned our battery board, got the boards made, got the components put on, and sold it to people. It's amazing. Thank you to McAllen for doing that. And thank you to uh, ADJ who figured out McAllen's boards initially didn't work because they had bad EEPROM flash. Uh, ADJ came up with a process to flash uh, a new EEPROM onto the Sunoco board. So thank you to the amazing people in our community and everybody else who's contributed one way or another to our community. And thank you for coming in to this talk. I guess do we have any questions? Hello. Um, so, uh, what do you think would be the the challenges to actually uh, work with KiCad from from the start to the end on designing this? Uh, which are the, f the failures, the, the deficiencies in, in KiCad currently that you can observe? Like, wh why do you still use Altium if it is possible to fully convert it to KiCad later? Well, I've heard from people who are, so the biggest problem is uh, it's called a EDM, a schematic capture software. The biggest problem is it's like an editor war, Emacs or VI. Uh, everyone really loves using the program that they started with. And a lot of people in university started with Altium or started with um, PADS or one of these other software packages. And so a big problem is people aren't familiar with KiCad. And another problem is until recently it hasn't been very good, honestly. And it's still very different from a user 
perspective uh, than other software packages. For example, the concept of a project is still very weird and one that's very specialized in terms of electrical engineering but is very unfamiliar to somebody who's not used to KiCad. So it's a combination of the design paradigm and the fact that people aren't used to it. Um, there are also a number of specialized routing modes that until recently weren't available in KiCad, but those are now available uh, and uh, it's, it's getting a lot better. I remember at the CCC Congress in Germany when you first, uh, along with Bunny, showed off the project and it was very wonderful for people to see a working laptop that you built yourself. And since you have it here, I was wondering if you could hold it up so that people could see uh, what you've done, and that you have a working laptop here in the room of your own design. Sure. I mean, if anybody wants to come up after the talk um, or out in the hallway, feel free. Uh, first, I want to congratulate you on your project. Um, it's the kind of project I ever dreamt since I started computer engineering. Um, but I, w I want to have a question. Um, I see you use ARM CPU. That's quite proprietary instruction set architecture. So do you have any plans on designing your own SOC using maybe sending to a foundry to be in an ASIC or maybe using uh, FPGA, that, that kind of in between midway that Xilinx provides for it, provide taking a project from FPGA to, to ASICS. Uh, do you have any plans on regarding the SOC? Because the SOC is still proprietary. Oh, the SOC is proprietary, and the problem is there is no way to get a non-proprietary system on a chip. Even if you design it completely from the ground up, you still need to use uh, intellectual property that the chip foundry gives you. You're still going to use their layout for flash memory or their layout for RAM um, because it's proprietary to how they assemble the chip and until you're designing your own chip fab you're not going to be able to do everything from scratch. Having said that, some of the other chip architectures are interesting, uh, especially what is it, low risk and uh, risk V. Those might be interesting if they become more performant but the idea is if we do another board, I'm going to want it to be even faster than this. And a lot of the newer architectures are slower than even this uh, ARM chip. All right, cheers. Hello. Uh, my first question was already answered now that you said about the proprietary licenses. But I want just to know about uh, how much uh, notebooks have you, how many have you sold to now and about the market that people was interested in? Uh, what happened at the end of the project? Well, um, one of the problems I mentioned earlier that you can get CPUs quantity one for about $45. Um, we get it for a little bit less than that, but not much. One of the problems with low volume production is that prices are very expensive. And as a result, the Novena laptop is very expensive. And at the end, it's not a super modern laptop. It's about as fast as a 10 year old laptop, but it's good enough for most things. 10 year old laptops are good, uh, good enough then. Uh, if you're not doing high end 3D games, thanks to Moore's law, it's perfectly acceptable to use that today. Uh, in terms of units sold, I, it's, I want to say about a thousand, maybe it's 500. It's, it's definitely below the 1K mark. Whereas most other companies to, to produce any sort of laptop would never sell anything below the 100,000 mark. So this is definitely a niche product uh, and the prices reflect that. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I had the impression that there is also an FPGA on board. Uh, can you talk us uh, a, a little bit about that? Uh, that's correct. There is an FPGA on the board, uh, and we have used that for other projects. It makes this laptop really great for hardware hacking. Um, there are a couple of issues. It's a Xilinx. It's an LX45, so it has a lot of logic cells. 
But FPGAs are a bit of a hot button topic when it comes to free software because all of the FPGAs, with the exception of the Lattice LS40, um, require a closed source tool chain. And even if we were to put a Lattice in here, they don't have a high speed SIRDES, so we wouldn't be able to do things such as HDMI video or um, PCI Express or any of these other things. Having said that, the FPGA is very useful for doing emulation of mem uh, flash memory. We did a, a one-off project to see if we can get an oscilloscope working. Um, we did uh, a project where uh, we actually use a Novena to program devices in the aspect uh, in a fa factory for another line of products we do. So the FPGA, because it is a reconfigurable block of silicon, allows us to do a lot of interesting things but it still requires you do development on an x86 machine using closed source software. In the back. Hello, today it's, we have a preoccupation with um, proprietary blobs on my computer. So, because the difficult to acquire hardware, we don't have much solution to remove proprietary blob. So, how I can buy this type of hardware you sell that's free of proprietary blob? I'm sorry. Um, was the question how can you buy it? Yeah, it's what you you are selling. Not book. <laughs> yeah, well, one of the reasons why we go with crowd supply versus someplace like Kickstarter, uh, and now I'm going to sound like I'm advertising for crowd supply here, they are more geared towards hardware uh, rather than uh, software or ideas, which is what Kickstarter or Indiegogo is known for. If you want to do an open hardware project, I really recommend giving them uh, a call because with crowd supply, aside from the fact that they do all the warehousing, so we just ship all of our products to Portland, Oregon, and then they ship it out all over the world, when the campaign ends, the campaign page turns into a storefront. So before the campaign ended, there was a fund us button, but now that the campaign has ended, it's either a pre-order or a add to cart button. And at least, uh, I believe we have main boards in stock. We don't have the rest of it in stock, but you can buy right now crowdsupply.com uh, just a main board. Uh, and there are people in our forums, uh, I mentioned McAllen who was working on uh, building battery boards. I think he might be doing a, another run, I don't know. Um, but you can, using just the board, there are also projects in the forums to turn a bare board into a laptop. Um, so it is possible to get the bare board and then turn it into a laptop yourself if you want. Right now. We can see from here that the form factor of the laptop is a bit on the backwards. Big. It's very big for a uh, portable computer. Do you have an, any projects or uh, more, more fitting cases and a more, a more portable approaches pro to the to the laptop, so to the open source laptop? I mean, that's a good question. It, I mean, we sometimes forget that until a couple of years ago, this was the size of, of most laptops. It was only in the last 10 or 15 years that the, the move towards thinner and thinner laptops became uh, a thing. But the problem is you can buy, uh, so a lot of the items on the motherboard are very tall. And so in order to buy slimmer components, they generally cost more money and this is already a fairly expensive project uh, in itself. So in order to go thinner, the price has to go up. And we made the decision that uh, for now, we're going to use thicker components and have a thicker case. And as a result, we can also have a thicker battery that lets it last longer. Um, one of the biggest uh, th reasons of thickness, one of the biggest sources of thickness is the memory socket. We decided that we wanted to have socketed memory uh, because we want people to be able to put in a lower size chip if they want lower power or if they want, um, 
Uh, maybe they want to use the chip for something else. Uh, ideally, initially we wanted one gigabyte and two gigabyte varieties, but we ended up just putting four gigabytes in everything. Um, and having the memory socket itself was very unusual in this aspect. But uh, we'd have to remove that and put chips directly on the board, which would limit which types of RAM people could use. And there are a number of reasons that included the thickness of the components that caused us to have a thicker board. It may be that if we do a second generation, the lower profile components will be cheaper. And so the next generation board will be slimmer. But we designed this case to have a removable side panel. So if we do come up with a newer board, it'll be able to slot into the same case and you'll be able to use, reuse the case. So we designed that to be forward compatible. So even if there was a slimmer profile board, it'll still fit in this case. Although maybe in the future there will be a thinner case as well. Okay. I think that's time. Thank you for coming.